this, uh, this last week in my preparations, uh, I definitely am, am feeling the, the, the weights of returning to daily thunder, uh, which is when it's actually daily. I don't know, we've been joking over the past 12 weeks that it's been like periodic thunderstorms because we've had one a week that's been released and it's like been tremendously uh, nice, <laughs> I have to admit, <laughs> to not have so much because I've been preparing four messages a week for a long time until this last 12 weeks. And so to step back into that is a unique thing. So tomorrow we have our very first session that I'm giving in a new series called Abe Lincoln, uh, Spiritual Lessons from Abe Lincoln's America. And it's gonna be extremely powerful stuff, but it takes a lot of time uh, to prepare. And uh, so in these weeks, you know, when I'm also preparing a sermon, uh, it's, it's a unique thing because I ran out of time this week uh, to do much. I'll just say it that way. It was like I had to do all my filming uh, before uh, Friday. I was, I don't even remember what was going on Friday, but I remember I was tied up. And so I prayed and I said, God, I have, I have a need. I have a need for a supernatural enablement. God knows that I'm not just sitting around on my thumbs, you know, growing moss. I'm working hard. But have you ever been in one of those situations where you still have an assignment, but you don't have a clue how you're going to carry it out without supernatural enablement, without supernatural wisdom, without supernatural efficiency, without supernatural speed, without the clock actually standing still <laughs> for a while? It's like, okay, God, I at least need one more day, but I don't have it. I feel like this message falls into that category. Uh, I sat down and I had about, and this isn't an exaggeration, about 15 minutes. Uh, and I was like, God, I have no more time in this whole week, uh, and yet I, I need a message for Sunday. And so, like I said, this is a little small message, but it's, it is very apropos, it is very significant, and I, I just trust that God can take the small things and uh, do something powerful through them. Uh, sweet words spoken. Uh, I think that's a honey jar behind. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's very appropriate. I think the picture is, is really nice. Even, I even like the, the title, Sweet Words Spoken. Now, if you were to gather all your family together and they were to be asked a question and you had to leave the room and you know, the, whoever's hosting this uh, thing, it, it says to you, uh, you know, all your family members, uh, all right, I need you to answer this question truthfully uh, and the answers will be kept confidential. The one in the other room will not know what you are going to say, right? When you are around this family member, is it sweet words that they speak or would it be, there's another term in scripture, brackish, which would be salt water? Uh, are they salty words? Are they harsh words? Are they, are they tender words or are they hard words? how would we be described? Because I, I, it's unfair to say, hey, let's get the body of Christ together and have them measure us because usually we have our best words that come out when we're here or when we're around people that aren't under our skin. Hey, that's a great time to talk to me. I can get some really sweet words out. But how do we speak when we're around those closest? Ironically, those are the most important words we speak and yet those oftentimes are the words that have the least amount of grace poured into them. It's almost like we shortchange those words that are around family. We, we like save our grace, you know, all this great deposit of heaven that God's given us to be noble, powerful, loving examples of Christ in this world. We like save that over here. It's like, I'm going to reserve that for when I really need it to like reach the lost, you know, all those people out there that don't know Jesus. But then I'm, I'm not going to, you know, splurge it on my family. I don't want to waste it there. And that almost seems to be a statement of something that has taken place inside of us. And that's what I would like the Spirit of God to put his finger on in our life. How should we speak? These words are very, very significant. Every single one that comes out of our mouth matters. In the eternal sense, it matters. But many of us have cheapened the value of a word, and we prove that by how quickly we will speak words that are either wasteful, that are either nonsensical, or that are harsh and opposite the very nature of the king that we represent. 
So the weight of words, Matthew 12, 34 through 37. <clears throat> uh, by the way, this isn't me just talking to you. This is Jesus talking to you know, the, the religious leaders of his day. However, how it impacts us, we should listen in. You know, If we're a brood of vipers, I say, hey, let's acknowledge that we're a brood of vipers, right? Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now that's a, a very weighty statement that could make many of us wriggle in here. And there's nothing wrong with the wriggling. In fact, I don't mind the body of Christ wriggling. Sort of like when Ananias and Sapphira fall over dead, and everyone in the body of Christ just suddenly, it says the fear of God came upon the church. Yeah, and you know what? That's not bad. It does not mean that God intends to knock you over dead. It just means it should sober you up to recognize that falsifying, living a false, duplicitous life has impact. And if you have any falseness in your life, in your words spoken, you want to get those out as quickly as possible because the God that just did that is the God that you are calling on. And so as a result, the fear of God needs to come upon the church. It's not bad to wriggle. Now, I was telling my kids, because we were going through Matthew, we, we went through this exact scripture, and we're, and we're talking it through, that there is a weight of law that is in scripture. It's very real. And it demands perfection. It does. Because this is the behavior of God, and to participate with God, you need to demonstrate this behavior. And in every single one of us, is going to fall short of that, which means every single one of us could fall on the wrong side of the ledger when it comes to the Word of God. And we could be where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And yet there is an invite in and through the very man speaking these words, the same one that is going to uphold the law and say, this is perfect righteousness, how are you doing? Are you measuring up? And then, of course, if you're a religious person, you're going to feign or act as if you are. It's like, of course I am. How dare you even question my righteousness? And yet what Jesus is actually doing is he's removing the veneer saying, none of you match up. And yet you will be held accountable for the way you live in this body. The way you are living needs to be as God would intend it to be. Is it? And it's okay, by the way. It's a very good idea for you to acknowledge that it's not. And for you to humble yourself before the perfect standard of righteousness and say, but God, my tongue is not functioning the way it ought to function. That is actually the beginning of salvation right there. You see, when you acknowledge with this tongue that something is wrong in this body, it brings you into what we know as salvation. When with this tongue you justify yourself, you literally sever yourself from that salvation. This tongue seems to be a beginning place. And of course, that becomes very, very symbolic when we end up in Acts chapter 2. And we see the advent of the church when the Holy Spirit comes upon the body of Christ. He is going to grab a hold of one specific part of the body, and he is going to start there. You see, when God is doing a new work in us, oftentimes it starts with us humbling ourselves and using this tongue to make some things right. Isn't that interesting? Even before these hands follow, these feet follow, the rest of our body follow. Usually it's our tongue that is coming into alignment with the kingdom pattern and we are humbling ourselves and confessing that was wrong. Will you forgive me? And that is a beginning point. So there's something about the tongue that is very, very telltale for the overall health of the body. And so as a result, if your tongue is functioning in a way that is unhealthy, it is a signal that something is off. And so if, as I bring up this message, you find yourself sort of wondering about all the words that you're speaking in your life, that's not bad. That's really good. And so what should we do? We should start something new with this tongue. And so we'll walk through that today. Matthew 15, 10 through 11. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth 
this defiles a man. You know, that's a very strange thing to say to a whole bunch of Jews who, remember, external law is a very big deal. What they eat, what comes into their body is a very, very big deal. And Jesus is going to say, that's not actually what makes you righteous, is, you know, making sure you're all uh, perfect on the outside. But what is coming out of you actually is the definer. So if what is coming out of you is false, is lies, is deceit, is frustration, is anger, is hatred, revilement, eh, something's wrong. It doesn't matter how many times you wash your hands and how clean your food is and if you're eating kosher. Because you're proving that something is still wrong on the inside. But if what's coming out of you is sweet, if what's coming out of you is love, if what's coming out of you is kindness, ha, huh, something is right about your life. Because guess what? Apart from God, that could never come out. There is an evidence of something supernatural that has happened in your life. What comes out of the man, this defiles him. So if something is coming out of us, that is opposite the nature of God, I say we allow the Spirit of God to circle that and say, what's this? And we don't justify it with the same tongue and go, hey, I'm fine. I'm better than, I, this is my phrase, I'm better than Chuck down the street. There's always a Chuck down the street. Now, if any of your names are Chuck, I'm really sorry about that. But there's always someone down the street that is living a worse life than you are. And you're looking to yourself going, well, compared to that guy, I'm doing great. Now, that is the worst way you could live life. First of all, a lot of marriages function that way, too, where a woman's sort of like, but honey, you know, I'm just more desiring this type of behavior out of you. He's like, what? You should be happy that you have a guy like me. I mean, if you were married to Chuck, just imagine how bad that would be. Yeah, and that doesn't really console the woman, if you've ever noticed that. Uh, so to not justify with this tongue, but to humble ourselves with this tongue and say, you're right. Lord, you're right. Something's a little off inside of me. I find that I have anger when I'm supposed to have love and patience and kindness. I don't like that. But Lord, something's wrong in this system, in this working. Could you intervene and change that? You have your, yourself the beginning of something new right there. The shocker. I know this is, this is quite the moment, like for those of you that didn't know this. Christianity is not humanly possible. I know some of you could look at that and go, what's the good of us gathering here then? See, Christianity is possible. It's just not humanly possible. And you can say, well, that doesn't make any sense because I'm a human. What, what hope do I have? You see, God is the one that makes it possible. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, God says, I purchased your body with my blood. Would you give it to me? Because I can do this. If you allow me into your body, if you allow me to have your tongue, guess what? I can get some sweet words out of that. But if you justify and if you hold on to this territory and say, but I can do it, God. But I can be righteous. You see, that's the first step in the wrong direction right there. The first step in the right direction is to humble yourself and to acknowledge, I can't do this. Isn't that a funny first step? Because we live in a culture where the words I can't are illegal. Now, some of you grew up in homes like, never say I can't. And yet Christianity is founded upon the statement, Lord, I can't do this. But you can. So never say God can't. That's a better way of saying it. Because he can do it. You are unable to actually rule your tongue. And I don't know how many of you have ever figured this one out. Have you ever had it where you, you, you notice a higher standard, you, you, you see it, whether it's in a book, and you have, there's a character there. Like I, for me, it's like uh, Little House on the Prairie, and it's the dad in Little House on the Prairie. And he, this guy is just so good. He's just such a good dad. And I can't remember his name right now, but I tell you what, every time I watch him, I'm convicted. I'm like, boy, he handled that so much better than I would have handled that. Oh, he has so much more patience. Oh, what a great line he delivered there. And I, oh, I didn't deliver that line. And so, but what we have a tendency to do then is to dig into our own pockets and say, okay, I'm going to be that dad. And yet that dad is, first of all, a little bit of showmanship, and he has a script, and he has a whole bunch of helps that I don't have, right? And he has cut, cut, no, let's do it again. 
20 times if necessary. I don't have cut, cut, let's do it again. Eric, no, you didn't have the right attitude in that one. Leave the room, come back in, let's do it again. No, I got one take. (laughs) And oftentimes that one take isn't quite right, but we have to go with it, right? And that's how humanity has to work. And so when you see that high standard, when you see the dad from Little House on the Prairie, and you feel the conviction as a father to realize that something's a little off and misshapen inside of you, that you're not, you don't have the same patience that you should. Because it's not, not true. In other words, what you're seeing is actually a really beautiful picture of Jesus. And we crave it, but we oftentimes try in our own strength to produce it. Okay, God, here's my New Year's resolu- resolution. I'm going to be like you this year. And he's like, oh, what a great idea. And it sounds really good on paper, but it's impossible. I can't be God. But I can yield to God and acknowledge that I'm not God and that I seriously need God. And he wants to move in and make this his residence and make this hand function as his hand would function. Make these eyes look where his eyes would look. Make this nose discern and sniff out that which he would discern and sniff out. Make this tongue speak that which he would speak. Make this heart beat with his very burdens. Make Eric Ludy care for what he cares for. Make Eric Ludy tremble before what I should tremble before. You see, this is a God work. Christianity is not a human construction. It is something built by God. Who gets the credit for it when it's done right? Not us. Just like in the story of Gideon, we must be diminished. And until our our troops are peeled away and we have to acknowledge, okay, God, I can't win this battle outside of you. He says, okay, now I can use you. Now we can get this done. Moses was taken to the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. What happened before he was taken to the backside of the wilderness? He's like, God, I think I understand why you put me here in Egypt. I think I've got this figured out. I'm probably going to be like a rescuer, deliverer sort of character, right? And so, all right, I, I get it. I can protect your people. And he took, takes it into his own hands and ends up having to spend 40 years on the backside of the wilderness recognizing that he can't do it. And after 40 years, what's he saying when God says, I need you now, Moses? Moses like, I can't do it. And God says, exactly. You see, now you're ready. You see, until God empties us, until he trims down our armies, until he gets us to the place where we can acknowledge with this tongue, God, my tongue needs you. Apart from you, my tongue can't speak those sweet words, and I can't be like the father in Little House on the Prairie. But Lord, I trust that you have called me to something more than just futility in this body. However that works, I'm your man. Come in. Take hold of this life known as Eric Ludi and live through me. Take this tongue. I want my words to be sweet words spoken. Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So I, in my preparations for my spiritual lessons from Abe Lincoln's America. I have a message this upcoming Friday. And I'm dealing with the North and the South uh, dimensions, and the feud is what that message is going to be called, between the North and the South. And these people, the Puritans up North and the Cavaliers down in the South, hated each other. And they could not see one virtue in the other side. They couldn't. I mean, they were totally blind to any virtue. So they would tout their own strengths and virtues and be like, see, this is where we're strong and this is where they're weak. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like our world today? We are totally blind to any virtue on the other side of the ledger (laughs) and we're, we're totally blind to any faults that we may have. And when you begin to function this way, ironically, it expresses itself in and through your tongue. When you self-justify and you're unable to see your weakness and you only can see the weaknesses in others, what are you doing? You are, you are cursing instead of blessing. You see, this tongue was given to us so that we could bless, so that we could bring life to the earth, so that we could strengthen those around us. And yet, you, we can so easily 
mishandle it. Isn't it interesting that God entrusts us with a tongue in the first place? If we were God, can't you imagine how smart it would be if we said, all right, all right, no, 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 you do not get a tongue until you have lived at least 70 years in this body and proven perfection. Because you hand someone a tongue and what do they immediately start doing? Just think about a little baby. Ah! And that's the first thing they do with it. They start making howling noises. And the next thing they do is like, no, mine. It's like sin is being expressed. That's it. So it's like, come on, remove the tongue, God, and we have a lot better situation here. However, God entrusts us with a tongue. You guys, some of you are parents in here, and you know the moment when you, your, uh, your first baby was born and the panic that also was associated. It's beautiful, and it's full of panic. And you're thinking, why would God entrust me with a life? And you're like, you're scared, you're going to drop it. You're like holding it out like this. If you're a guy, you're like, oh, no. And then the first time you change the diaper, it's like, oh, it's, it's a scary thing. But it's like being entrusted with a tongue. God, for whatever reason, has given us something, a trust. And every single one of us in here is going to fail with it first. Isn't that an interesting thought? It's like he knows that. The way we are bent is going to be expressed in and through this. Watch that man and you will know what's inside of him. How? Listen to him. You see, and you will be able to know that there is something off inside of his soul. However, you can also watch a man that has been redeemed and changed and determined that he has been redeemed and changed by listening to him. In, in other words, turn out the lights and just have tongues start talking and you can tell who's who. Isn't that a weird thought? That our tongue is the giveaway. It is the flag. It is the standard that we hold up above our life and you can tell which side we're on. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So Matthew Henry, I was, this is in my studies for Abe Lincoln's, uh, you know, spiritual lessons from Abe Lincoln's America. It's a very long title that I have to say. And when I was going through this, because I was going through it at a different point, on a different uh, scripture in Romans 12. There's a lot in Romans 12. And when Matthew Henry made a commentary on this statement of bless and do not curse, and obviously I was moved by it because I stuck the whole quote in the message. That's a rare thing for me to do. First, so if you have someone who is cursing you, if you have someone who's hollering at you, making your life miserable, what should you do? You handle this tongue very different than the world would. What's the typical person on earth when they get hollered at, when they get shouted at, when they get slandered, when they get falsely accused? What's the normal human thing to do? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You holler at me, I holler at you. You accuse me, I'll accuse you right back. Hey, I can win at this game. I'm a really sharp guy. I have a really quick wit. Don't mess with me. That's like classic humanity, right? And yet, the Christian is going to evidence themselves as a Christian in the very fact that when the assault comes, they respond very differently. Now, this isn't just in interacting with a world that is hostile to Christianity, but this is also in our home. There are circumstances where if I could say, okay, us as fathers, where something is not done the way we asked it to be done. Okay, there's a quality standard that we as fathers somehow inherit. You know, even though we were the ones always getting in trouble for low quality when we were young, somehow we still are holding this high quality standard when we become fathers. And then when we see a lower quality standard thrust upon us, that is actually the proving ground for what's inside of us. Boy, I'm convicting myself in my own message. Why am I doing this? And yet that's precisely what this is referring to. Bless and do not curse. Use that tongue wisely. But God, I'm really struggling with my tongue. For whatever reason, it keeps saying things that are hard instead of soft. It's finding criticism coming out of it instead of encouragement. Lord, what's wrong up here? First, speak well of them. If there be anything in them that is commendable and praiseworthy, take notice of it and mention it to their honor. But that's my enemy. That person doesn't deserve that. You have to earn the right to get an encouragement from my lips. And God doesn't seem to agree with that. He says, I want you to adopt that person as a special friend. What, the one that just punched me in the nose? Yeah, that one. 
and I want you to consider them, and I want you to pray about them, and I want you to find their virtues, and I want you to encourage them. Well, who in their right mind wants to do that to someone who's bopped you in the nose? One of the common things I'll say to students that come through here when they're struggling with their parental relationships back home, I said, you should write a blessing to them and write a letter to them of all the things you appreciate about them. And of course, they're thinking, what in the world appreciate? All I can think about is the things I don't like. And as a result, when all you think about is what you don't like, you stop noticing the virtue. And even, I mean, there's probably someone out there that doesn't have a lot of virtue that you could name. Like if we were saying, okay, guys, let's have an exercise. Let's find out all the virtues about Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler. You pick which one you want to do. And of course, most of us would be like, that just seems like a bad exercise, (laughs) Eric. And that's the way it feels for a lot of students that come through here when I ask them to do that. Because to them, they can only see evil behaviors. And they have lumped everything, the entire character of their parents, into one evil lump instead of recognizing that God is working in them or has worked through them and has done things in them. But we have a tendency to stick on a a, a pair of glasses that blocks out everything positive. So to go out of your way and to actually speak words that encourage. And there's all sorts of people in this world that I could say, yeah, that's going to be harder, right? Right? But at the same time, what a beautiful exercise to consider. If Jesus came to us, how in the world, could you imagine him interacting with this same exercise with us? It's like, okay, take Eric Ludy and say something nice, Jesus. And he's like, oh boy, that guy is just a pile of problem. Instead, when he speaks to me, he speaks words of life and encouragement. And even when he's correcting me, I always sense his booing encouragement. That's amazing. He's really good at this. Sweet words spoken. So that's the first one. Secondly, speak respectfully to them. So even when you're talking to them, show them honor. The way you speak to them, you uplift them, you strengthen them, you don't degrade them. Have you ever had it where, you know, you could say, you know, if you're, if you're your husband, you understand with this, that there's the right words to speak to your wife. You know, like, I love you. And you can speak the right words, but not speak them lovingly, not speak them with authenticity. Right words spoken, uh, that's a start, but let's get the realness behind it. Because if Jesus is hearing us going, yes, I praise you, Lord, you're really incredible. You know, that doesn't mean much to him. But if we are captured, enraptured in his beauty and in love with our Lord, then he can discern that in and through even how we speak it, how we sing it how we live it. So secondly, speak respectfully to them according as their place is, not rendering railing for railing and bitterness for bitterness. So now the the third one. And thirdly, we must wish well to them and desire their good, so far from seeking any revenge. And this is, of course, what I would typically say is the definition of love right there, is that we're seeking someone's good, that we are literally after their highest, Now, when it's an enemy, why would you do that? Over these last couple years especially, and I'm not going to say it hasn't been this way for a long time in America, we have a two-party system. And if you look back at the beginnings of our country, we had a two-party system. We have been divided as a country from the beginning. We have been fractured. We just think it's today. It's like, oh, we really have a problem today. That's why I'm doing this entire series in the Abe Lincoln era, because they were more divided than we are now, to the point where they're killing each other. Uh, I mean, it was really bad, okay? I'm not saying we're that far removed, but it's very interesting to see how that two-party system can work. And what it tends to do is force a separation where the solution inside of your soul is that the only way this nation is going to work is if they finally wake up one day and realize they don't belong here. They need to find another country somewhere else to go and have it. And if they were to get out, boy, we'd finally have our country back. This has been, by the way, this is not a new thought. And so in the Civil War period, the Cavaliers to the South had a singular conclusion. I don't see any other conclusion other than just eliminating the North. That's like our conclusion, because they are overstepping their bounds, they're threatening us, they're threatening our way of life, and our way of life is so much better, so much more noble, so much more honorable than theirs. And the Puritans are looking down to the south, and they're like, we have a problem. 
and unless we eliminate these cavaliers and all these slaveholders, we will never have a moral country that can have the blessing of God upon us. Both of them were virtuous in their own eyes. You know, they were all Christians too. That's what's extra weird. And for us, we need to recognize that we must wish well to those that oppose us and desire their good. What would that look like if the South <laughs> handled it that way? When the North, the Puritans have a tendency towards morality, that was their strength point. The Cavaliers had a, a more of an emphasis on honor and chivalry and hospitality. And so they looked at themselves, they saw their virtues, and they're like, they, they are so self-righteous and pompous up in the North. And then the North is looking down at the South going, and they are so immoral. They, they have blinders on. They can't even see how they're treating their fellow human. And both were righteous in their own eyes. And both wanted the evil to be perpetrated against their enemy instead of good to come to their enemy. As Christians, we have to do it different. We have to think a different thought pattern. We cannot fall into a two-party system. We cannot allow the political maneuverings of our age shape us and form us in the way we live out our Christianity. We are outside of two parties, and we are loving both in both. We are loving all in both. That does not mean we don't have personal views of how we would vote, because I'm sure we will, right? And of course, most of us would conclude, and there's a better way than, a, than, a, than another. There's one that's more biblical than another. However, we need to be watchful not to entangle ourselves in the hostilities of the pol politics of our day and function as Christians. Now finally, fourth, nay, isn't that a great way to start this one? Nay, fourthly, we must offer up that desire to God by prayer for them. You see, you're gonna take this tongue and one of the ways that you're going to evidence a change in your life, that something is different about you than the rest of the world, is you don't just bless and not curse, but you actually, and you don't just say, oh, you know what, I, I love them, I want their highest good, but you prove it by actually taking time in your life and investing in them in the way that you know is the most powerful thing you could ever give them, the greatest gift you could ever give them, which is the prayers of the saints. And that is a Christian. A Christian is taking this tongue and leveraging it, not just to silence it when the enemy comes in and slaps him and punches him and spits upon him and like, but okay, I'm not saying anything. Silent as a lamb under slaughter. And yet you take this tongue and you speak words of life. I bless you. I just want you to know how much I love you. And I'm going to be praying for you this week. Oh, by the way, most people don't appreciate that right after they punched you, right? They're sort of expecting the retaliation. Instead, when you pull the, the carpet out from underneath them by showing the love of a Christian, it really messes with them. It's like, what was that? You have something very, very special, but you need to know how to get it in action in your soul and in your mind. So listen to this. Nay, fourthly, we must offer up that desire to God by prayer for them. If it be not in the power of our hand to do anything else for them, yet we can testify our goodwill by praying for them for which our master hath given us not only a rule, but an example to back that rule. Luke 23, 34. Bless and curse not. It denotes a thorough goodwill in all the instances and expressions of it. Not bless them when you are at prayer and curse them at other times. You ever had that? Where you bless someone at prayer and then curse them every other time during the day? You have your, you know, your religious zone that you walk in where you're all loving, and then you have your political zone that you walk in and you're all mean. It doesn't work. Bless them in, when you are at prayer and curse them at other times, but bless them always and curse not at all. Cursing ill becomes the mouths of those who work it to bless God. Cursing, sorry guys, let me read that. I, I read it, but I didn't read it with proper uh, enunciation. Prop, cursing ill becomes the mouths of those who work it to bless God and whose happiness it is to be blessed of him. Dangers of the untamed tongue. It seems like I had a sermon probably like 10 years ago called The Dangers of the Untamed Tongue. All right, So if you're really into this topic, you can go find that. James 3, 8 through 10. No man can tame the tongue. Isn't that how we started this whole message? No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it, with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. 
So we have a very clear statement in James that this tongue cannot be ruled by man and that it is inappropriate for it to both bless and curse, to give out sweet words on one, one side and then brackish words on the other. It, it ought not to be this way. The beauties of the tamed tongue. Now, some people come to the conclusion that, well, in James it says no man can tame the tongue, so obviously it's just an unruly evil. We just sort of put up with it. Instead of recognizing what the entirety of Scripture is saying, it's saying, yeah, you can't, but he can. There is someone who can rule the tongue. His name is Jesus Christ, and he does it via the Holy Spirit. And he does it via the Holy Spirit by moving into your body and making it his home and grabbing a hold of that tongue and training you how it is to be used and then empowering you to use it properly. So this is a pretty simple way of describing what happens in the church of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, other tongues. Now, of course, some people, we could get distracted with the issue of speaking in tongues, which could divide us really quickly and be uh, not very edifying for our morning. Or we could recognize what is happening here in maybe a bigger picture. And that is that God is entering into his church, and he is grabbing a hold of the tongues of his church. And he is giving them an other tongue, or in some translations, a new tongue. And that's a really good way of looking at it. Whether this tongue speaks in different languages or not actually isn't my point today, okay? Because I'm not going to argue against tongues at all uh, as far as the fact that there's a supernatural tongue that can be given that can speak a language that other people may not know unless it's interpreted, right? And that's a biblical concept, but also divisive and not necessarily going to probably be helpful for our discussion today. But if we were to recognize that the Holy Spirit comes in and gives us another tongue. He gives us a new tongue. He gives us a tongue that can function different than the tongue that we have been wielding. If you had a new tongue and you had an old tongue, which one do you want to be using? I would encourage you to use the new tongue, the tongue that is set on fire by the fire of heaven instead of the tongue that is set on fire by the fire of hell. Two, one that is very susceptible to the devil's game, and one that is very susceptible and malleable to what God wants to do in this earth. And you see the disciples, even at this exact juncture, when they have this new tongue, walking into the streets of Jerusalem and proclaiming the glories of God with that new tongue, boldly. This is the same city in which Jesus died 50 days earlier on a cross. And you know what a cross is supposed to tell you? You see that guy up there? See the one that's suffering? Yep. Anyone who follows him and does what he did will get the same treatment. That's what public crucifixion is for. It's to scare away anyone from following such a leader. And yet in that very same city, all of his followers are going to boldly enter the same streets and speak with this new tongue. You see, it is not normal for any of us to speak boldly in the streets of Jerusalem 50 days after a crucifixion. That is not normal humanity. But we're not talking normal humanity. We're talking Christianity. And Christianity is something altogether different. It is empowered supernaturally by the Most High God. So you can choose to live with your old tongue and be susceptible to the devil and his games. Or you can forsake your old tongue and allow God to establish a new way of speaking, a new tongue, a new tongue that is set on fire by the fire of heaven that enables you to speak words of life and blessing and encouragement and strength, even in the hardest moments when what would typically have come out is anything but. So for all of us in here, I would say let's allow God to freshly work within us to say, I don't want the previous tongue to be my master. I want Jesus Christ to use my tongue to speak life today. 
You cannot do it in your own strength. But you can do this in and through Christ's strength in you and through you. Father, this is something that we all need. This is something that is a daily need. It's a daily relinquishment of old tongue unto new tongue. It is a daily decision to side with our God instead of to side with our flesh and with ourself, which is why we must die daily. But Lord, here we are, the church of Jesus Christ, and we crave that mighty rushing wind rushing into our own temples and setting us on fire, starting with our tongues, that we would evidence the kingdom of heaven in and through the words that we speak and the way in which we speak those words. We love you and we trust you, and we know that this is something you are desiring to do, and not just desiring, but will do as we come to you in faith, believing. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we ask this. Amen.